Messalianism was a monastic movement which appeared in Mesopotamia and developed further in Syria during the last part of the 4th century. Their name comes from the Syriac word Msaliane, which means the praying ones. It is the participle of the word Salla, prayer. They were also known as Eukites in the Greek sources. They called themselves spirituals, beggars and the poor and believed that prayer was the only important thing, considering sacraments of the church as unimportant. Jerome had labeled the Messalians as the heretics of nearly all Syria, despite attempts to expel them from the region. Although the origins of Messalians were unclear, it had become one of the stubbornest and frustrating heresies in the Eastern Roman Empire. The Council of Ephesus ordered the capture of anyone suspected of being a Messalian, whether clergy or lay people, and called for their anathematization. However, this heresy continued to be a problem, and church leaders for next two centuries and beyond continued to create new canons against Messalians and document their activities. The late 4th and early 5th centuries were a crucial time for subordinating ascetic laymen to the institutional authority of church leaders. This involved the promotion of orthodox monastic arrangements and the marginalization of those deemed to be heretical. Ascetic sentiments were observed not only among the Messalians, as the Manichaeans, who incidentally were very often confused with the Messalians, the Neoplatonic ascetic movements such in the Gnosticism and Paganism and the Monophysite monhood also fell into disgrace. The desire to absorb monasticism into one direction and subject it to ecclesiastical authority was a purely pragmatic move and a consequence of the centralization of power. Being totally dependent on the laity who supported them with the food and shelter, Monks were an authoritative voice against the Roman bureaucracy. This was naturally exacerbated by the enormous diversity of religious trends in antiquity. The people who pray were noted by church authorities as early as 373 CE, with Ephraim writing a hymn that referred to them and called them Psaliane providing little information other than their manner of prayer which might be considered overly boisterous or agitated. Epiphanius was the next in line of critique. He criticized Mesopotamian monks for their idleness and refusal to perform manual labor. Epiphanius sought to discredit the Messalian trait he found most reprehensible by linking it with the Mesopotamian heresiarch Mani and emphasizes that divine word instructs people to mark those who do not work. As he stated, they show no restraint and stretch out their hand to beg on the grounds that they have no livelihood and no possessions. In the late 4th century, the definition and history of Messalianism became more elaborate due to actions taken against certain Mesopotamian monks at synod held in Antioch. Bishop Flavian of Antioch initiated a search for possible leaders of Messalian activities in the region of Edessa, which led to the arrest and hearings of Adelphius, Sabas the Castrated, and several others. Adelphius allegedly confided to Flavian the belief that only zealous prayer, not the holy baptism, can drive out the indwelling demon and bring the old Holy Spirit, which leads to liberation from the agitations of the body. During the tenure of the bishop Atticus at Constantinople, heresy started receiving attention at the highest levels, and a synod was held to address the problem. The synod ordered the deposition of any cleric suspected of harboring Messalian heretics, and Emperor Theodosius II later on included them among the most objectionable heretical and schismatic group forbidden by law to assemble or pray anywhere on the Roman soil. Finally, in 431, the Council of Ephesus anathematized the Messalians' book Asceticon and any other writings of their impiety, and authorized measures against any cleric or layman even suspected of such disease. 
The punitive inquisition against the Messalians coincides with the same treatment of the Jews, Manichaeans and Samaritans. The Messalian characteristics condemned at both Constantinople and Ephesus are preserved by Timothy of Constantinople in his early 7th century manual on the reception of the heretics. In it he wrote that Messalians claim that after achieving apathia, they can see the future and discern invisible powers. They avoid manual labor and call themselves spiritual ones, believing it is neither possible nor righteous to handle a work. These points are reiterated by the John of Damascus who lists them after citing 18 statement of Messalian doctrine. It is hardly surprising that Messalianism might be perceived to be such a widespread problem, especially when the Council of Ephesus included anyone, even suspected of the disease. Nevertheless, two main traits are consistently repeated. Refusal to practice manual labor for the sake of continuous prayer and the claim to material support from the others. The Syriac Church had to continuously deal with the issue of Messalianism in the 7th century too, which resulted in intense rejections and condemnations from Babai the Great, who was known as a Messalian hunter and would travel to different monasteries to expel them. This phase is characterized by a deluge of refutation of Messalianism and violent opposition to it from Orthodox leaders. In history, it is very often referred to as a monastic crisis in the Syriac Church. The composition of the Quranic text falls within this very period in the history. But can we see a reflection of this historical atmosphere in the Quranic text? Several passages in the Meccan verses specifically in the chapter 17, 43, 73, 74, and 76, as was pointed out by the Carlo Segovia in his article Reimagining the Early Quranic Milieu, demonstrate a shared belief in the importance and benefits of prayer. To better understand these similarities, we can group them in three overlapping categories. The first category pertains to the benefits of nightly prayer and its potential personal advantages. Like in the chapter 17, verse 79, which instructs believers to arise and pray during the night. The second category is related to the continuous remembrance of God through nightly prayer. The initial verses of the chapter 73 urges believers to stay awake through the night, except for a short period, to remember God. The third category identifies those who didn't pray in their earthly lives as a sinners who will be punished in the afterlife. The verses 42 and 43 of the chapter 74 shows the inhabitants of hell admitting that they didn't pray. It should be noted that with the sole exception of the last verses I quoted, praying is not listed in these verses alongside other things. It stands on its own as a fundamental activity whose exercising and eschatological virtues are repeatedly underlined. Also, it must be observed that Quranic references to praying are built on the triliteral Arabic root Sad Lam Wa, whose instantiation in the corpus often echo the Syriac orthography, as the letter Waf is anomalously used in it to render the long A sound that goes after the Lam in the noun prayer, Salat which is thus written in contrast to classical and modern Arabic. It is written Sad Lam Wa Tamarbuta instead Sad Lam Alif Tamarbuta, mirroring the Syriac Slota, which has a Vav to mark the O sound of the second syllable. Another critical aspect is the use of the same active participle as in Syriac. The Arabic word Musallina which appears in the three instances in the Quran, mirrors the Syriac msalyane, the same word which was used by Ephraim to denote the heretics. In all three instances in the Quran, this participle is used with a definite article. These Quranic verses emphasize the importance and benefits of prayer, particularly nightly prayer, as well as the consequences of not praying in the afterlife. As it stated, what brought you to the hellfire? And they will answer, we weren't among those who pray, we weren't among the Messalians. 
The Syriac influence is significant because Syriac Christianity was associated with a monasticism and asceticism, and the Messalians, Manichaeans, Marcionites, and Crotite Gnostic movements may have sharpened the ideological core of the Quran. The attempt by the Nestorian Church in the 7th century to bring the monastic movements in Persia and Mesopotamia under its authority could have caused widespread protest in the ranks of the aforementioned schools. This emphasis on individual piety and direct relationship with God may reflect the influence of Messalian ideas on the Quranic text. Messalians were known for their rejection of traditional religious authorities and emphasis on personal spiritual experiences. Later in history, the teachings of Bogomils would be identified by church authorities as a revivalism of Messalianism. Bogomils believed in the importance of individual direct relationship with God and rejected the idea of mediation by priests or bishops. They believed that the Holy Spirit dwelt within each believer and guided them in their spiritual journey. They also rejected the concept of Eucharist and the authority of the church to forgive sins and perform sacraments believing that only God had the power to do so. Their rejection of ecclesiastical authority and emphasis on individual spiritual experience anticipated many of the ideas that would later on inspire the Protestant Reformation. I certainly won't make a claim of theological continuity of thought and practice, however I will say that placing Quran in its historical context gives a much deeper understanding of the evolution of religious thought and practice in the Middle East and beyond. And with you was the host of the Gnostic Quran channel. If you find my content entertaining, don't forget to support the channel by subscribing or through the coffee platform. May you have a blessed day.